I'm doing it. So I have this book right here. I have this book by Tom, The Business of Belief. And I don't know how I got it. I don't know who gave it to me. I don't know how it arrived on my bookshelf, but there it was, right? The Business of Belief. And you guys have heard of um, The Biology of Belief, right? The book Biology of Belief. Well, here's a book, The Business of Belief. Now, Tom, um, Bruce Lipton, when he's writing in The Biology of Belief, is, is talking about how our biology, our, our, um, our belief, our thoughts and feelings influence our genetic expression. Tom's not doing that. Tom's talking about how people know that if they want you to buy things, if they want to influence you, they have to change your belief structure. And it's an amazing read for those of you who are getting in the coaching business about belief structure and how to influence belief. And it's written in, it's my kind of book. I like how it's written, um, but it's so, so applicable to what we do in NLP. So when I, when I read a book, I do that to it. I put tabs all over it, right? So all my books have tabs all through it. But this tab here says, memory is a construction. So here's a guy talking about business and he's talking about memory being a construction, a construct, it's not perfect. And that's completely in line with everybody and aligned with everybody who researches memories. Julia Shaw, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, uh, Sapolsky, all these people who research it, that's complete aligned. And he talks about it in a very non-NLP way, but at the end of the day, it's absolutely um, NLP-esque. Now, once I started reading, here's a chapter saying, minds make meaning. <laughs> minds make meaning. And you guys have heard me say that nothing has any meaning except the meaning we give it. So here's Tom Asaker, Asaker talking about how our minds give meaning to everything. So I started reading this book with a different eye. And I love this chapter. We choose, therefore we believe. Belief is a choice, right? And, and so many times you and me and our clients say, you know, no, that's just the way I am. Well, no, <laughs> what you believe is You've chosen to believe it. And so I, I read voraciously. I'm always looking for understanding as to why what we do in NLP works when it works. And I look for, I look for people who are not neuroscientists per se, but who understand the same phenomenon as we do differently. So Tom is one of those people that just get it. Now, he's a character. He is a real character. He was a, he's an artist. He's an inventor. He's an author. His career has been quite varied. <clears throat> and so I reached out to him after reading this book. I reached out and said, uh, could we have a conversation? And so last week, he and I hooked up on Zoom, and we had an hour-long conversation. And it was like I was talking to my brother from another mother because he was joking about having done this and that and the other thing. I said, well, Tom, you know, if we could have a competition, here's my CV, right? Here's what I've done in my life. So it, if we're going to compete on weirdness and variety in our, in our career paths, you, you have a unique one, but here's what I've done. And we started laughing. And then we started sharing insights and understandings into how people work and how we understand. And, and it was probably one of the most engaging conversations I've ever had. And then he told me about his new book. So he has a new book, uh, which I'm going to give away a copy of tonight, called Your Brain on Story. And, it, and it's about the stories we tell ourselves and where those four stories are formed. And it, it is a, it's a conversational book. It's a book written in a two-part conversation, as if he's talking to someone. It's quite fun to read. Um, and this segues from the presentation I did before Christmas on story that I'd heard on a, a Jordan Peterson podcast. And the guy, I gave away a book that night as well. Um, and I'm trying to remember the guy's name. Fergus was, uh, Fergus was his last name. Anyways, and he's at the University of Ohio actually studying how literature changes our brain function when we read, when we read literature. He's the only person doing that in academia. 
So how the actual reading of literature, the, you know, how, we, how it changes our chemical structure in our brain. So I don't, <clears throat> I don't know where this obsession about story is emanating from for me, but since Tara and I got into the NLP business, I've always had a term that I love that, that's quite endearing to me, and I call it our techno-rational bullshit that we tell ourselves and others. And what am I referring to? I'm referring to your story, of course, right? It's a techno-rational bullshit about our why we are where we are, right? And so when Tom and I got talking, and then he started telling me about his work and where he was going, I was quite moved. So tonight, I'm going to talk about some of the things that he presents in his book, Your Brain on Story. And at the towards 30 minutes from now, maybe 20 minutes from now, I'm actually going to play a 20 minute excerpt from one of his training courses. And in that 20 minutes, when I watched this the first time, I was just moved by how much NLP is in there. And he doesn't, he's never been trained in NLP, he does not know NLP, but he knows about language. He has studied psychology, sociology, a whole bunch of ologies, and he knows what works from a business perspective. He's been a consultant in business, helping businesses capture market share and hold on to them, knowing language, what influences us. He also talks about, uh, about all of us being in a hypnotic state, that our reality, that our reality is not real, <laughs> He actually dabbles, gets to the edge of psychedelics and suggests that in his research and talking to people who have done psychedelics, that psychedelics actually remove all the filters and all our stories for a moment. And we're actually seeing reality. We're actually seeing the construct. We're actually getting connected to the wholeness. And I found that profound as well. So I don't know actually where to start. This is kind of interesting. I don't know, and somebody might say they might, uh, I forget which nursery room is, you should start at the beginning or wherever you should start at the start. It's probably a good place to start. Starting in the middle is um, difficult. Emotions come from your story. Emotions come from your story. And, I, and when he said that, I, I, it's one of his quotes and I got stuck on it. And then I said, of course, emotions come from your story. This is what Lisa Feldman Barrett says, that our emotions are a prediction. Our emotions are a prediction of what should happen when we encounter a stimulus based on our past. And our story is created in our past. So, of course, our emotions have to come from our story. Think about that for yourself and your clients. All right. So when your emotion, when your client said, I got so angry or I was so sad or I was so moved or I was so whatever. Now I'm interested in how their story informed them to be that way when they encountered that trigger. Right. Again, I'm always in the what and how they're doing it. Right. Not why they're doing it. That's still not a why question. I'm interested in what they do and how they do it. Well, they, how they do it is part of their story. Your mind being, meaning your unconscious mind, your mind is a wonderful servant and a terrible master. Your mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. But most of our minds are our masters, especially people who are stuck. A person in a stuck state is a servant to their mind. They are at effect of their story. Their story is inside their mind. And their story is not, and their, uh, sorry, their mind is not a good master. So we need our work as a coach. We actually help our coach when we get our clients from stuck to unstuck. We're actually getting our client to be the master of their story. And their story is now the servant of them. Right? That's what we do in our work. Use your mind and your emotions instead of letting them use you. Again, people who are stuck are totally out of effect of their mind and their emotions. Anybody, you know, without naming names, anybody who's been traumatized here knows that when your mind and your emotions run amok, you are at their mercy. Yeah, right? You can't get out of bed. You can't go to work. You can't do much, 
right? And we get trapped in our story. We get trapped in the story we tell ourselves and others. Because think about it, your story, <laughs> your story has boundaries. Your story has boundaries and those boundaries are vested, they're created, they're, they're, they're enforced, they're built on your beliefs. And those boundaries and those beliefs create your behavior. All right, we always talk about the three Bs of change. When somebody's actually have massive change, they have new beliefs, boundaries, and behaviors. So when we're helping clients, we're helping clients move into new beliefs, boundaries, behaviors, which can only happen if we help them create a story that is better suited to them. Again, you know, I wish I worked with high performance clients some days who came in and just wanted to make an extra million a year. That might be fun, but that's not who I work with. I work with people who are in stuck states. But I think even if I was working with really high performance athletes or business people, they would be stuck in their story. If they weren't stuck in their story, they'd be moving to, um, to where they want to be. As soon as their story, and as soon as the story they tell themselves and others limits them, describes why they're stuck where they're stuck, then of course they're limited, they're stuck inside their story. So, you know, each of us, you, me, your clients, we're the central character in a story I'm the central character in my story. You're the central character in your story. That's all about you or all about me. My story's all about me. Your story's all about you. And it's really a dramatic fiction, right? It's really quite a dramatic fiction. And we make that dramatic fiction coherent from the past to the present, right? Our story makes it's a fiction because all our memories are recreated when we have them. So it's a dramatic fiction that makes the past and the present coherent, makes sense of why we're here, our story, you know? And then it's driven, our, our story is driven by a goal to be safe and to, uh, to arrive at a better place. That dramatic fiction, you know, all of us want, you know, we're all here, we're coaches, we're helping people get to a better place. But I know that all of us want to get to a better place. I don't think, I don't think anybody believes they're at their ultimate destination yet, do you? Is somebody there yet? Help me. I don't think so. All right? So we've got this dramatic story and uh, we've got a supporting cast. We've got a supporting cast <laughs> in our dramatic story, the fiction. You know, uh, I have a wife and children. I've got helpers and supporters and I've got antagonists. And I, and I write their character based on my perception of them. But in this dramatic story I'm telling, you know, if you heard me talk about, you know, Tara, the kids, I'm, I'm writing a fiction about them. Through And it's informed by my history. So it's very, very interesting. And, and the story, when you come out of the womb, I forget the author's name, but he said, when we come out of the womb, we have a sense of connectedness. We have a sense of um, wholeness. And we, we have a sense of belonging and love straight out of the womb. And then through things that are said to us, things we learn, we start learning that we're separate from this connectedness to everything. Oh, you're a boy and you're a girl or heaven forbid you're a they, you know, sorry, I don't need to get all my predicates right nowadays, my pronouns, but you could be a, um, and, and, and you're a, a white boy or a brown boy or a native boy. Now we start becoming separate from the whole with every definition we put around ourselves in our story. You know, I'm a poor white boy from a mining town. Now I'm very separate from a lot of the world. And in the story that we create, 
And, and maybe I got told I was a fast learner or a slow learner, right? Who knows what, what story I was told? And, and the people who are informing my story, what age do you think? What age do you think they start shaping your story? Zero to seven. Absolutely, Rachel. Zero to seven. The imprinting phase. So when I heard him talk about these influences on our story, there was this congruence, this mapping of, of what we teach in NLP. And, I, and, and so here's a guy in this other world separate from me. And he has an understanding of the power of our narrative and where it's shaped and where it's formed and how it constricts or empowers us. And it relates exactly to what we do as NLP coaches. And what the beauty of the NLP and timeline therapy and hypnosis is, that we have tools that go to the, what I will call the origin story, to the beginning. And you guys have all done timeline therapy. Where is the root cause of most things? Zero to seven. You're not really doing, dealing with a root cause unless you're cleaning up something at seven. Where are most adverse childhood experiences that are haunting us as adults? Zero to seven. If a person believes they, they can learn or they're slow learner or fast learner or no learner at all, where was that installed? Zero to seven normally, maybe up to 10. But boy, the most impactful ones are there. And guess what? We get a story. Story gives us certainty. Can you imagine if you couldn't describe who you were or why, you look at Rachel snarl at that one. I love that look, Stuart, Rachel. Who you are and why you're where, where you are and how you came from and where you're going. Can you imagine how uncertain you felt if you had no story, right? So our story gives us some sense of stability. And the people around us all have a story and we're part of their story. Remember, we have actors in our story. Guess what? You know, if you have a sister and you're part of her story, which you would be good, bad, or indifferent, and you start changing, you start coming up with new ideas, you start thinking about possibility, maybe about doing things, or you leave your day job and you start a business, you affect her story. You impact her story and you make her story unstable what she was once certain about oh that's my sister Susie the bank teller <laughs> and now oops that's my sister Susie who quit her job got a backpack and is now doing the uh what's the the pray love movie <laughs> right that makes the other sister movie on her story unstable and I can give multiple examples of this what support groups AA the certainty when you belong to an AA movement is everybody comes in, they admit they're al uh, alcoholics, right? And everybody, that's a certainty there. If some person says, okay, I'm clean, I've been clean for five years, I'm leaving AA, that makes the other people's story uncertain and it causes unease. So stories, when we tell them, impact others. I use, I, I, when I'm working with my clients, I talk about the uh, John Bradshaw model of the world, uh, the model of the family as being a mobile with all the pieces hanging. And the mobile is in balance, but it doesn't mean the individual pieces of the mobile are perfect. Uncle Billy could be a wing nut way out here away from the middle of the mobile. And other members of the mobile here counterbalance Uncle Billy. Now, if Billy, let's say Billy is a raving, abusive alcoholic. He's way out here and you got some aunts and uncles who counterbalance him, who bring stability to that mobile, to the universe. If Uncle Billy gives up booze, goes into counseling, starts apologizing, he's moving within the mobile. The mobile does not become more stable in that moment. It becomes less stable. It does not stay in stasis. It becomes unbalanced because these people 
who are counterbalancing Uncle Billy, they, their role has changed. Their story has changed. By Uncle Billy moving, their story has changed and the whole mobile becomes unstable until everybody's story gets to a new stasis. And that's why sometimes when you're helping a client, their home situation doesn't get better right away. Especially if you're working with one partner and there is relationship issues going on. Two people both have their own story and they're in each other's story. If this person changes, this person's story is impacted. And you see this when people go away on NLP courses, right? Everything, you know, they, let's say they both have day jobs, husband and wife. Well, I'll do, uh, I'll do the quintessential thing. Husband and wife, they both have day jobs. And then the wife says, I want to be a life coach. So she goes away and she takes an NLP course. She's open to the possibility. She quits her day job. Now she's building a website and talking and public speaking. Well, Billy here on the couch, who used to sit and watch soap operas every night with Susie, and Susie's now up here, you know, out there. It doesn't have to be up or down, just out there, not on the couch anymore, doing something different. His story's now massively impacted. Just because Susie has opened up her mind to more possibilities and different things doesn't mean their relationship's going to get better. It could, <laughs> but it doesn't always have to. So when our stories change, we have to be cognizant of everybody else's story around us, how, they may, how we might be impacting it, right? And that doesn't matter if you're starting your own business, stopping drinking, going on a fitness kick, you know, decide to walk around the world or do something dramatic. It doesn't matter what you or somebody else does. When we change our story, what we're doing we're affecting somebody else's story, right? And we affect it rad radically. We actually make people feel uncomfortable. Right? And in this thing, uh, Tom talks about external validation as a generalization. All of us are worried about what other people think about us. We really are. We're seeking external validation. Even when we do the, the, the uh, meta program, you know, how do you know when you've done a good job? Do you just know inside or does somebody have to tell you? Even those of us who are just, no, I just know, I don't need anything. We're all still worried about what other people think about us, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't dress the way we do and we wouldn't comb our hair the way we do or brush our hair and do what we do, right? So we're all seeking some external validation. And I was interested that he talked about that and that we so clearly use uh, meta programs to identify that with our clients. And it is interesting, right? This is a beautiful metaphor. You know, if you have a flower in a field that normally attracts a particular butterfly and you plant a bu that flower in your yard and no butterfly comes, is it because of the flower? Is the flower less beautiful? Is the flower less a flower? No, it's just the butterfly wasn't there. It has nothing to do with the flower, right? And, and so if you want to attract butterflies, you better plant your flowers in a lot of locations, right? So a lot of us as coaches aren't attracting butterflies, right? We're just not. Some of us have great flowers, but we're not in the right place at the right time to, to attract them. And so I, I, I've spoke fairly intensively and rigorously about knowing your avatar. Well, that's knowing where to plant your flower, right? That's knowing where to plant your flower and where, and where your butterflies hang out, right? And, 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 and this is the voice of experience, the voice of pain and, <laughs> and thousands of dollars trying to find where my butterflies hang out because it's not obvious. You would think it would be obvious, but it's not obvious. And again, I'm telling you thousands of dollars of pain trying to find them. And I coach other coaches who are writing big checks as well to attract butterflies to their flower. And uh, yeah, once you find it, once you find the place where the butterflies, you know, butterflies migrate. So maybe you need to be on the migration path of the butterfly. Once you find that place, all of a sudden you got a lot of butterflies. You got a lot of butterflies. The same, by the way, is in honey production. 
um, if you if you are or sorry fruit production uh, uh, um, a fruit tree needs to be uh, pollinated so um, what a lot of people don't understand is apple orchards and cherry orchards they actually bring bees in they populate the trees with bees they don't wait they don't plant a tree and then just wait for the bees to arrive there's no guarantee that the flowers will will get pollinated to produce the fruit so so they circumvent that they bring the bees into the tree to make sure it happens right well we can't do that as coaches i wish, i wish i could just go grab the fire department and bring them in here and say all oh, you guys need trauma treatment but that doesn't work that way so i've got to go get them somewhere else so where do i plant that flower you need to plant it where they are. You need to be in the right field. Right on. So he talked extensively about the period from zero to seven, but he never mentioned it. He never mentioned it in psychological terms. He just talked about being conditioned by the people around us and the people condition us through their story. And their story is based on their history. Right. So you think that you and me, each of us is this unique amalgam of all the stories that influenced us from zero to seven. And, and what are the contributing pieces to that? Right. What are the uh, contributing pieces to those stories? I think is interesting. And, and it may be as crazy as. Um, I grew up. In a mining town with about 3,000 people in it. This is my true story. The son of a Finnish immigrant. So I, my story was of being a Finn boy. I used to joke that I was a Finn boy. I had quite light hair when I was young. And, and uh, Tara Guzzo in Sioux City, where's Tara's image? She's somewhere up here. There's Tara. Yeah, you know, she knows what Northern Ontario Finns look like, right? High cheekbones, a little bit gaunt in here and uh, light hair. So I had a whole story about being a, a son of a Finnish immigrant, having grown up. And I, and I actually thought my pet family was pretty affluent. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Because when I, you know, when I'm the youngest of six, we, we were doing okay. Like we actually had a house, and a car and all those things. Um, it wasn't until my adult life, after I left the military, and um, my sister did a genealogical search. She was searching for something on her husband's side of the family. But once she got into the archives, into the Catholic Church Diocese archives, which are just amazing uh, repositories of family information, <laughs> my family goes back to 1670 in Canada. <laughs> I, I'm also the, 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 whatever they call it, the ancestor of two women who came to North America which was quite a phenomenon in the time, you can Google these, the daughters of the king, the Fidoa. So the daughters of the king were women endowed with land in the new world in the 1600s. And there's about a million relatives of the Fidoa. So, wow, how does that change my story? I'm now directly descended 11 generations from the French settlers who came to North America to settle the country. And my whole story was before I was being the son of an immigrant. That's a pretty radical shift in stories, especially when you hear this part. When I was in the military, I didn't speak French. And I wanted to fly on a particular squadron. And they had made it a designated Francophone squadron. So I couldn't get the job. So I actively boycotted becoming Francophone. I was quite adamant that I would never, ever, ever, ever learn French. I didn't like French people for a while. Reverse discrimination sucks as much as discrimination does, trust me. And then my sister tells me, oh, you're 11 generations of Francophone Canada, Canadian. Deal with it, Alan. So all my kids are in French immersion. So that's how you compensate, that you make a quick adjustment. So change is a story though, right? What's my point? We're changing the story, my story. And the scripts that informed us, my mom never told us about these 11 generations of relatives that went back to the 16th, because I don't think my mother knew. Because at generation nine and generation 10, some English people married in, men married into the French lineage, and they all started taking Anglophone names. 
So I don't think my mother ever knew because they didn't study genealogical genealogy 100 years ago. My mom would be 104 now. They didn't study genealogy 100 years ago. So my mother never knew that story. So what's the point? All of us have a story. Oh, and by the way, the thing about it, thinking we were wealthy, <laughs> I was a really sick kid. So I got to see pictures of me sick in the crib. And I saw the one picture, I was in this onesie piece of underwear. It wasn't even a, like a pajamas, right? And it had all sorts of holes in it. And I turned to my sister, my parents had already passed away. I said, were we poor? And she just started laughing. She laughed so hard. She laughed so hard. She said, yeah, <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. That was the best they could do for you. You were number six. <laughs> that's, that's what you got. So yeah, it's quite funny. But in my mind, I never had that story, right? I mean, I'm never, it's, it didn't have any impact on me when, when I told that story, when I actually learned that story. So we're conditioned to believe who we are by what influences us along the way. And, and we are an actual metaphor for what we experience. Think about your NLP. We're an actual story. We're a metaphor. And our life, you know, we pursue how to be safe, how to be productive, how to be respected. And all of those are put in us by outside sources from zero to seven. When I listen to Tom speak, I just became more and more and more resolved that what we do and how we do NLP and timeline therapy is why we get such massive results. Because we're dealing with those exact inputs into the narrative. And we're choosing by getting at cause when you're doing timeline therapy, right? You're getting learnings and you let go of emotion. So you're no longer at effect of the emotion is why we're so bloody successful, why we have such and why it lasts so long. Why once we do it, it lasts so long. And so what's what's contributing to your script or my script, I, you know, or your clients, you know, it could be. What, what is involved in our script, our story, our color, our ethnicity, maybe our religion, maybe the community orientation, right? Did you grow up in a coal mining town or did you grow up in Silicon Valley? Did you grow up in a Mennonite farming community or did you grow up on the prairies in a wheat farming community? All of those things are going to affect your story and the boundaries of your story and the beliefs within that story. Right. And to know that it's just a story and not fact may be disconcerting to some. Right. Because we've told it, if you're as old as I am, you've told your story quite a bit. <laughs> right. Some of you guys are younger, you know, the Rachels and the uh, Olivia's of the world don't have to worry about it quite as much. Ashley, they haven't told their story as much. And the fact that you're here on an NLP course, you're actually open to investigating the quality of your story, right? Seeking a better story. Uh, unfortunately, our story separates us from the universe, from the earth, right? Humans talk about being on the earth as if we're like astronauts on this spaceship called earth. Humans very rarely acknowledge, you know, only, only sort of the environmental movement that we're actually part of. We came from a seed within the earth. Our whole story about humans separates us from the wholeness. And the more we identify with groups, the, the more removed we, come, we be, become from the whole. Does that make sense? Right? And the farther we get disconnected from the whole, I, I think the richness of life disappears. Because ultimately, you, when you start doing spirituality work, when you watch anybody who meditates, who does mindfulness, who, who preaches some form of higher consciousness, we're all talking about being connected. <laughs> we're all talking about wholeness. We're all talking about okayness. We're all talking about love. And yet our stories that put boundaries on us separate us from that. Interesting. I think my clients, I'm, when my clients come in and sit down, I think I'm going to see them in a new way. I think part of my clients' emotional struggles is that massive, we would call it disconnect, but I, this massive separation that they experience from the whole that is in their story. 
And again, my clients are traumatized. So that, and if they've been dealing with trauma for a long time, their story is one that's vested in pain and suffering from the trauma, which separates them, doesn't allow them to be safe with other people, right? If you're really traumatized, you do not feel safe out in public. That's a, a real key attribute of severe trauma. And so we run this, this uh, what I call the, the dramatic drama, and it's a, a, it becomes a serious survival story. Those people who have dealt with serious emotions, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, trauma, that is a serious drama about survival. That we talk about it, we play it through their head. There, a guy named uh, Blaise Pascal said, all of humanity's problems stem from the inability to sit quietly in a room alone. All of humanity's problems stem from the inability to sit quietly in the room alone. If you've got a rampant story running about your life, you can't sit alone in a room. I suspect Joe Dispenza can sit in a room alone quietly by himself. I just get that feeling, right? I get that sense that he could. I, I even think Sam Harris could sit alone. I wish I knew a more female. You guys can send me emails, okay? I want to listen. I want to find female equivalents for Joe Dispenza, Bruce Lipton, Sam Harris. I know they're there. I just don't know them. It's, it's not because they don't get as much airplay on YouTube. You want to look at white male oppression. Um, look at who's getting airtime on YouTube. But you guys send me emails for women who are at that caliber of thinking. I know they're there. I know there's hundreds of them. So just send them to me, okay? Because I, I, I need, I want to know. Tara, Atara, Atara. Well, there we go. I have to listen to her. Uh, Tara, of course, Tara sends me a Tara link. Who else would do that to me? There's too many Taras in my life. Okay. So now I'm going to have to catch them. Um, all right, I appreciate that, but seriously, send them to me. I don't want to say I'm lazy. I don't want to say I'm lazy, but you know, I I I will listen to the ones that come up easily on my phone. Right. So our our our, our nervous system has been conditioned to keep us in this drama. Joe Dispenza talks about that we're addicted, and Tony Robbins, that we're addicted to our problems, right? So the story, the drama, the emotions in the drama gives us the chemicals we've become used to. Without the chemistry, we don't know who we are, right? My naturopathic doctors, without chemistry, it's hard to know who we are, right? You can't, with no chemistry, you don't know if you feel good, feel bad, feel indifferent. So sometimes we don't feel good, but it's what we're used to. So we're nowhere, hey, this is me, I'm here, right? We know this is me even though the chemistry is not perfect and it's disturbing, but our nervous system keeps us stuck in there. And, and the interesting thing is that to undo it, we need to know the source of it. And again, this is why what you guys do as NLP coaches is so powerful because we go after the source. We don't deal with the symptom today. That's what allopathic medicine does. You got a headache, I'll give you a Tylenol, right? You got fibromyalgia, I'll give you some oxy thing, opiate driven painkiller. They don't go after the source, right? So the source of our dis-ease has to be vested inside the, in, inside the script. Does that make sense? That the source of most of our dis-ease is inside the script. And more and more, the more I listen to people, more I'm listening to actual MDs say, there's always an emotional component of every disease. A precursor. More and more, they're saying it. They need to say it away more. That there's always a negative emotional component. And, and we actually run away from the source of our problem into the false comfort of our story, in the false security of our story, because our story gives us a sense of certainty, right? My story gives me a sense of certainty about who I am, what I do, where I go. And if I have issues, rather than finding the source of the issues, I hide from the source inside the safety of my story. 
until it becomes unbearable or I break down or something happens. Rachel's nodding yes. Until it becomes, until you get up to that barrier. And I think what happens metaphorically, guys, just like a parts integration where you have to get outside the boundary of the part to get them to integrate, when your problem, when, when you can, when you cannot, when you can no longer find safety inside your story, you go through the boundary of your story and you find, you go find the source. So, so anybody who's healed trauma here, you got up against it, you had had enough, you wanted a solution, and then you went and found the source. And a lot of time, to your surprise and your chagrin, if you worked with me, I didn't work on the trauma first. I went after adverse childhood experiences first. And then I did a timeline scan. And most of you who have worked with me, something came up in your childhood that was beyond your recollection, that was beyond your conscious mind. And the scripts that you had had installed in you, that you had memorized and become your pattern of living, kept you away from the source and in this false safety of your story, of your narrative. Does that make sense? Kristen, does that make sense? My NLP trainer friend? Yeah. Cool. And we, 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 we fill our time with creating and solving problems. We spend our time, <laughs> Carrie's laughing. We spend our time creating and solving problems. <laughs> Not just solving problems. Hear me clearly, we spend our time creating them and solving them. You know, you're talking, and, and this is an addict talking to you now, man. If there wasn't a drama to fix, I'll make one for you. Just trust me, right? I spent a lot of my, a lot of my adult life creating dramas to heal traumas, creating things that need problems to be need to fix. And we hold on to the past, right? Our clients, especially, but us as coaches too, if we, if we, if we don't do work and clean up our past, we're holding on to our past. A lot of us won't let it go. And, and I know a lot of people get all the way through NLP trainers training, hypno trainers training, timeline therapy trainers training, and they haven't let go of their past, right? And, and the challenge then is you guys as NLP coaches, your problem, and you guys have all heard me say this in class, but your problems are getting as smart as you are. If you think your problems don't come to the NLP training and listen to everything you listen to, you're, you're, you're living a delusion. You're living a delusion. So if you're becoming a black belt NLP coach and helping other people overcome your problems, your own problems are learning every tactic that you're using with your clients. Mm -hmm. And that's why some of us, you know, you don't want to work with me. You don't want to be my coach. My problems are pretty quick. And they're going to come at you and they're going to argue and they're going to contest and they're going to ridicule you and they're going to be complete. You know what? Right. But all of your problems are getting smart. And, and if you stay away from the source of your problem, you're going to hang on to the past. You're going to pull it into the present. And then the, what we do with our spare time then is we create happy ever afters. We spend our time, we create and solve problems, we hang on to the past, and we create happy ever afters. Right. And Tara did a, se a session on creating micro habits to achieve those happy ever afters. But that's what a lot of people do inside their story, right? And, and by the way, setting goals and doing plans to get there are great, but, but they take action. They take action. So again, we're born with a sense of oneness, connection, and love, and slowly that gets taken away from us with everything we're taught from zero to seven. Because the more um, we get taught about how we're different, the more we get separated from oneness, the more we get separate from connection, but we get a, a new connection. We get connected to family. This is your family. This is your town. That's why people like sports, right? That's why people... You know, you go to England and Liverpool plays Chelsea and a war breaks out in the street. Because I'm from Liverpool and you're from Chelsea. They belong there. They're not connected to wholeness or oneness 
or anything bigger. They, they've now come down to being part of a, a soccer club, a football club, right? But that's not a higher level of connection. That, that is a serious, a serious drama being played out when your identity is vested in a soccer club. <laughs> that's a hell of a movie. Right. All right. So, um, you know, and if you thought, if you think about your story uh, being taken to the big screen, part of you as a director inside your, 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 your movie set, right? Part of you as the director of your movie, there can be no other way. And, and Tom talks about going to improv class because uh, I'll just read some of the things. A director is a logical talker, but the improviser is an intuitive doer. Our school system creates logical talkers. We get rewarded when we go to school. Here's that zero to seven thing happening again by being clever, right, and smart and logical. Little Johnny, who's just an intuitive doer, doesn't do well in the school system. The intuitive doer gets punished. <laughs> he is the tough to manage kid. She is the tough to manage girl in the class. The clever, right, smart, logical talker gets rewarded. Right? Your improviser, or sorry, your director discriminates, but your improviser wonders. Tara and I have one ethereal child who's always off in La La Land. And uh, he's the one that the teacher said, you make bad decisions. No, he doesn't. He just thinks he's a ninja right? He doesn't think he's a boy. I'm sorry, maybe you need a new movie script. Maybe if she was connected to the whole, she'd actually know he wasn't from Earth, but she's got her boundaries, beliefs, and behaviors, right? Mika is different. Your director is interested in control and usefulness in outcomes. Right? How many of us spend, spend most of our day in our director head? We're really interested in having control. What's useful to me? How can I get a better outcome? How many, and your improviser is interested in connection, care, and caring experiences. How many, how many of us spend the bulk of our time in that one? I, to be honest, I, I don't. I should. It's way more fun, right? And your director's perspective is as narrow as it gets. It's zoomed in on the story of you separate and lacking and is so it is in conflict with everything and everyone your story your director is in conflict with everything and everyone that holds you back that doesn't agree with you all the time it makes meaning based on its identity which is strengthened by differences and problems your director everything is yes no either or to your director there is no nuance this also sounds like masculine energy Black and white zeros or ones, yes or no's. Feminine energy is all inclusive, right? It's so, uh, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. So the, your improvisers focus on the other hand is broad, nonlinear, holistic view of reality, perennially open to whatever arises. That sounds like feminine energy, by the way. It, it, you know, if you read David Dita's book, uh, any of the Data Dita, David Dita's work, uh, the improviser has curiosity, compassion, and creativity. And the improviser instinctively knows the truth is complex, interrelated, and always in flux. And it's discovered in the felt and flowing world of experience. David Dita says the feminine energy does not lie. It tells its truth in its emotional moment. The masculine energy is always black and white, yes or no, zeros or ones. And so black masculine energy can get frustrated at feminine energy and call it a liar. Because yesterday I asked you the color of the carpet and you said it was gray and today you say it's taupe. Well, yesterday and in my emotional state yesterday, it was gray and today in my emotional state, it's taupe. Masculine energy doesn't have the capacity to deal with that flux. It wants it to be yes or no, black or white, zeros or ones. Right? The improviser cares and the director compares. The improviser is inclusive and prefers the new. Your director is self-focused and prefers the known. How many people really like to, to be, are comforted by what is known? Let's see a show of hands. 
how many people just, how many people really like the unknown? Like, I don't know where my next paycheck's coming from. I don't know any, anything. Rachel, I love you to bits. <laughs> right, more improviser. And your improviser knows when something's right or not right, but can't articulate it and logically defend it. Right? So kind of cool, right? The director part of you wants to defend everything with fact and the improviser part knows it's right or wrong, but can't articulate it. So imagine that you're in your director part and somebody you know is in their improviser part <laughs> and you're demanding to know why you know it's right or wrong, right? But you can't articulate it, yeah. And create and, and the defend a creative impulse or the depth of her love for nature or other human beings. The director on the other hand is highly skeptical and believe he has everything figured out. He is relentless in his intention to convince you with his carefully crafted words and highly pervasive arguments, deconstructing life to create safe, consistent, predictable, useful story. Right? So part of us, each of us have an improviser and a director at work. Right? So here's the thing that struck me. Right? You guys have all heard us teaching in NLP. Um, say it the way you want, not the way you don't want it. Right? We often have people when we ask them what they want, they can't tell us, they tell us what they don't want. And we say, no, you got to get looking at what you want, right? The more you focus on what you don't want. So Tom has, has a twist on this, which I thought was really, really instructive and inter interesting. He says, so the first thing you need to do is figure out what you don't want and stop doing that. Figure out what you don't want and stop doing it, which exactly aligns with us. I loved it. It will quiet down your director. So it quiets down the director and free up your mind to hear what's been quietly calling you, to see what's been hidden from you. I thought that was a beautiful, you know, when I'm looking for language to explain, move away from, move towards, you know, tell it the way you want it, not the way you want it. I thought that was a beautiful way of expressing it, saying to free up your mind to hear what's been quietly calling you and to see what's been hidden from you. I think that's beautiful. And of course, that's possibility. If you quiet your fearful, impulsive mind and open up your humanity, your curious, compassionate nature will be drawn to unexpected happenings. All right, so, you know, start triangulating ideas. I, I in PRAC, I often present a book or almost always present a book called Power Up Your Mind, Power Up Your Brain, sorry, by David Perlmutter. And there's a, a page in there based on research, hard, 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 hard research that says that if we, there's a, a new discovery in neurons called a microtubule and a large neuron can have a million microtubules in it. And each microtubule can do a thousand transactions per second. And Perlmutter, who's an oncologist, the other guy who's a physicist and the other guy, I think, I forget his specialty from the University of Arizona, said that if you could stop, if, if a person could stop their thinking, fear, greed, sex, and worry, we would be able to have non-local transactions, meaning we could communicate long distance. And, and here it is in, in Tom's work saying, if you quiet your fearful, impulsive mind and open your human open it to humanity, your curious, compassionate nature will be drawn to unexpected happenings. So again, I start triangulating ideas and thoughts, and no wonder what we do as NLP coaches is so powerful. And then the last thing I'll share with you is, is a, a thought on purpose. You'll also come to discover that purpose isn't something you pull out of yourself. This Purpose is not something you pull out of yourself. It's something you passionately build in out of your spirit, your experiences, and your values. It is not something that you find or uncover. It's an essence that you reveal through your choices and your sacrifices. I thought that was such a beautiful summary of what and where we get purpose from. So again, the guy's name is Tom A. Saker. And um, he's amazing. And so as you listen to that biology, or sorry, the business of beliefs and his new book, his new book, the um, Your Mind on, or Your Brain on Story, really great reads. 
He also has a course, and I think it's 8.30. I don't think we'll have time to show the 20-minute clip I thought I was going to show because we're going to go to Q&A. So the really question you need to ask and you need to be aware of, I think, is as you're thinking about yourself is who is the author of your story? I think that's a critical piece to stay with. And then when you're looking at your client, who is the author of their story?